Got it. My colleagues, Robert Berg and Richard Poncio wrote the paper, Firefighting and Preventing Fires, a new vision on the future of peace building offering proposals to enhance the effectiveness of peace building, peacekeeping, and conflict prevention. It is my pleasure to introduce you here to my, <laughs> technically to my left, <laughs> um, Robert Bob Berg, who served as a board chair of the Alliance for Peace Building and is currently serving as its senior fellow, as well as chair of Plan for Peace, the UK nonprofit devoted to long-term peace building solutions. And I would be remiss not to mention that he also serves in the advisory council of the UN Association of the National Capital Area where I serve. So let's dive into it, Bob. You have spent decades in the field of international development and working with several sectors. Why and how did you get into the peace building field? Okay, little bit of pause, while we, okay. Uh, oh, you have second. your volume on? Yeah, I have it up. Okay, yeah, can you hear me now? Richard, okay. I got involved in this because um, when I was 25 and a half, I made my first trip essentially overseas. Uh, to Nigeria. I was a young guy working with USAID. I was backstopping about $300 million in projects and I wanted to see them so that I knew what I was backstopping based in Washington. So I spent two months in Nigeria and I came back and I immediately went to the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the State Department. And I said, there is going to be a civil war in Nigeria. And I laid out my case for that. And they very correctly said, well, how old are you? How often have you been uh, overseas and to Nigeria? Uh, what do you know about wars and their cause? And of course, I flunked every single one of those questions uh, as far as they were concerned. But they uh, checked with the embassy and the embassy said, no, there's no sign of anything. 18 months later, the war broke out. Three million people were killed. And it left me with a severe case of inadequacy about how come I didn't know better? How come there weren't better mechanisms to prevent wars like this? So uh, later on, much later in my career, after I was senior advisor to four different parts of the UN, uh, where I ran across such fabulous people as Paola, who was one of the great uh, uh, fans and, and promoters of the UN. Uh, I uh, at, was asked to join the board of the Alliance for Peace Building, and I've kept my interest now for the 15 years uh, to see whether we could do better in preventing conflict and saving the investment of families, communities, lives. Uh, around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Can you all hear me? Thank you, Bob. Considering the changes and complexities in the peace building field and the ongoing challenges, the strategies for peace need to be more complex, varied, and commensurate to the scale of the causes. What has, in your opinion, Bob, work, and what hasn't when it comes to firefighting efforts, including conflict resolution, peacemaking, and peacekeeping, and to fire prevention? Okay. Well, let me just say that historically, we have been fighting uh, fourth century AD doctrines, two of them. One was the doctrine that if you want peace, you should prepare for war. The stronger you are militarily, the less likelihood there will be war. And the second doctrine was St. Augustine's doctrine of just war. 
saying that there are some wars that the church would say would be correct. And you'll recall that just within the last year, the Rus Russian East, East Orthodox Church leaders saying that the war with Ukraine was just. And those two doctrines uh, ha have had a remarkable life. Well, as Paula indicated, we have 32 active conflicts in the world, which means 32 conflicts in which more than 1,000 people a year are being killed. Uh, arms sales now, because of the war in, in Ukraine, are actually up, except for Russia's. They're not, Russia's arms sales are down 80% because they're using all the arms in their war that they otherwise would sell. But U.S. arms sales are up 50% and the rest of the world's arms dealers are doing very, very well. Violence is much more complex now than it used to be. It isn't just a matter of egos between different leaders like Ukraine at the moment, Putin's ego, but it's climate, migration, the rise of authoritarians, terrorism, and a more active international subversion of peace. Look at the situation in Syria, a major drought. It forces people off the land, they go to the cities, they migrate to the cities. The authoritarian government doesn't know what to do about it. They neglect all those people. Those people then turn to, to attacking the government. The government attacks back. Uh, that creates a climate in which terrorists feel that they can come in and, and seize hold. And then Russia and others join in as part of an international program. Every single one of the common causes now of conflict are in that one conflict. Uh, and it's very, very difficult to know what to do. I don't say that peace building, peacekeeping is easy. Uh, when Syria was going on, I, I, uh, at its height, I talked to a friend of mine who was a 30-year long professor at Harvard, uh, who's a specialist in the Middle East. And I asked her, what would you do? And she said, well, there are 300 militant groups in Aleppo alone. Now, which ones do you want to support? She said, none of us really know. These are very complex situations. Uh, how have we responded? Paul asks, what are the good and the bad? Well, with, with serious talent, uh, the UN has been improving its performance. Nonprofits have been improving their performance. Sub-regional and regional groups have had notable excesses, uh, successes such as ECOWAS and to a certain extent, the Africa Union and the OAS, raising the standards of good governance, uh, pushing against military governments. Uh, there are more political alliances and almost all conflicts end by some kind of negotiations. Peace building has perhaps an even better record. Peace building professionalism in nonprofits and public administration, quality of staff, evaluations, Program impacts show that there's great improvement in performance over recent years. There's more unity amongst organizations working on peace building. Uh, there's lots more civil society groups working extremely effectively. There, uh, we estimate, Dr. Ponzio and I, that at least 5,000 civic society groups working locally around the world, many really helping build local peace. Uh, and there are some real policy victories now. Uh, the the uh, Sustainable Development Goal 16, the first goal of the global community to, uh, to focus on, on enhancing peace, and reducing violence. And in the United States, the peace building community bringing us the Global uh, Fragility Act. We can be proud of these kinds of achievements, but we also must be clear-eyed. Peacekeeping is slow to mobilize. It's not very cohesive. 
between the various groups that respond to the UN's call for peacekeeping uh, operations. Very little interoperability. It's not linked well with fostering peace. It's now subject, the UN peacekeepers and others, to being attacked themselves and civic resentment. And some of the peacekeeping operations tend to last forever. The poster child of this is the Spanish Sahara. When negotiations take place, it's rare that they include women. It's even rare that they include civil society. Um, and I need to know if there are any cases of peace building civil society experts being present in the form of peace negotiations. Very rare. We have no common mission as a field of peace building. Official programs and NGOs work. It's too small. It's largely crisis oriented. It's not well coordinated. Uh, the majority of work is fairly short term in when you think of the span necessary to inculcate peace as part of culture and part of governance. Uh, and the field is frankly a little bit too dominated by Western organization. Now, I have to conclude from that, being as cold eye as you have to be, that there's very little big time success. There's been wonderful successes like Colombia, but that, that's the exception to the rule. Compared to other fields of endeavor, of human development, of health, of education, uh, um, that our field has, has had a, a less than great record. And in any other field, there would be criticism to say, how can this field be improved? And that's what brought Dr. Ponzio and me together to say, okay, if you take a long-term view, what would you do to really make a difference in the future of peacekeeping and peace building? Perfect segue. We heard during the course of PeaceCon the importance of building coalitions and partnerships that empower local state actors. What's the future of peace building? What would enable the peace building community, communities, and other key actors to effectively build lasting peace? Could, would you let me first talk about peacekeeping? Uh, I'm just going to answer that question as if you'd asked it about peacekeeping, okay? okay? We would love to recommend a, recommend a standing international security force trained, ready to go quickly into action, composed of military and civilian capacities, but it ain't gonna happen. So we didn't recommend it. We wish it could happen, but we can't recommend things we don't think are really doable. What we do recommend are two steps that we think would be very helpful. One is to build up the UN's civilian response capacity, add 500 staff to the UN and get, create a volunteer course of about 2000 multilateral staffers for critically needed professionals, professionalism in crisis situations like reestablishing and reinforcing law, getting good engineering so that serve public services, water, electricity can be reestablished, and administrators to make sure that there is governance, um, even under difficult circumstances, that you can uh, pursue as many of your individual and corporate rights as possible, even under stressful situations. And secondly, we would establish a standing and reserve capacity to support rapid deployment of police, allowing countries to have as much stability in, in towns and cities as possible. 
that it, think of it as just in time police. Uh, we have a number of recommendations of this in our paper uh, to deploy faster, to better train, and to try to quickly restore law and services in the policing. That would help us in the peacekeeping area, and those are doable. Peace building is a much more complicated task. And we have a handful of, of recommendations on this, and I'll just quickly lay these out for you. First of all, to improve conflict analysis and crisis warning, and to find early indicators of crisis in the development field, one of the indicators of, of famine was when farmers start selling their livestock. Then you know that there's real hunger and famine. Now, we, we, we are at more and more indicators now of when societies are beginning to fall apart and where violence is rising. But we have to really get those indicators and have the the governance, the multilateral and, and national governance really do better conflict analysis, conflict prediction, and crisis warning. Secondly, it's very, very important that the UN's Peace Building Commission be empowered. It needs to be upgraded. It is now too weak and it is it needs to be strengthened. Um, it needs uh, to become a peace building council. And uh, one of our little dreams, we didn't put it on our paper, is that you have this trusteeship council that no longer is needing its quarters in the UN headquarters because we don't have colonies anymore. Uh, and wouldn't that be a nice place to have the peace building council, give it a real home. But Right, right now, conflicts are basically settled in the in the uh, to be settled at the Security Council, which is pretty stalemated on a lot of these things. It needs to concentrate on the biggest issues, nukes, and big power potentials for collaboration. All the other conflicts ought to be in a council which can act quickly and have a mandate to say, you guys need to really get your acts together and we're gonna help you by, by quickly deploying peacekeepers, by getting mediators out there. Um, and we're, we, we are going to, we have policies that need to be developed and, and employed of cross -cut, to address cross-cutting problems, regional violence, climate, uh, better mediation, so forth. So that's uh, upgrading the, the Peace Building Council, very important idea. The third, the UN has now long had uh, uh, its uh, resolution 1325 to, uh, to have women more included in the peace process. This, pro that needs to, implementation of that needs to be accelerated. It sounds like it's just a little exercise in diversity. Well, we have one guy, we should have one gal. But in fact, a, a 2014 study of 156 peace agreements said that when women are involved in it, the peace is more durable. So if, there's, if there is actual quantitative information that this is a good thing to do, for goodness sakes, let's get over the chauvinistic attitudes of too many peace negotiators and get good peace building expert women in there to, to, to help out. Fourth, peace building audits. There has to be real accountability. There's better lesson learning. And uh, for example, we really ought to be measuring this uh, Sustainable Development Goal 16 against uh, 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 the, the lessening of violence and the increase of peace. 
Uh, I must say that when I was many years ago at USAID and established their evaluation system, and then was the initial chair of the evaluation, evaluation for the OECD, that getting internal accountability is really important to get that into the bloodstream of organizations that you don't just do your job, but you're accountable for results. Fifth, we have to, to really give a lot of prominence to the issue of transitional justice. That is, that getting post-war disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration far more effective. Justice aimed at promoting peace and reducing the risks of violence. Uh, one little uh, aspect of that currently are the off-ramps for foreign terrorism. The Alliance for Peacebuilding was very instrumental in, in working with the US Department of Defense to say, look, the strategy against terrorists isn't just to kill them all, because frankly, you know, you they'll grow back up. The, 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 the longer term strategy is to provide off ramps so that people who had been terrorists can get back and be productive as societies. Uh, uh, there is now some progress on on that, the, the, the US government had really forbidden everybody to deal with any terrorists and any terrorist organizations. Now, uh, uh, and there are still rules restricting access to talk peace with terrorists, but there's been some movement towards more openness on this. Uh, at this conference of the Alliance for Peacebuilding, there were calls by some people to say we ought to be recognizing the, the Taliban government. We may not agree with it, but we have to talk with it. Six, we have to take longer view, a longer view based on shifting responsibility and abilities to local authorities. We just had a panel here on shifting peace building to local authorities. And it brought to mind to me uh, when, when, when out of their ignorance, I was asked to join a kind of hoity-toity club in Washington, DC that didn't have any women members. I joined it on condition that they understand that I work for women members and we, we spent a lot of time on this and were quite effective at the end. But along the way, we were opposed by the widows of former members. And they said, if you allow women to be first class members, then we're going to be second class members. Oh, God. Now, I think the development community and the peace building community sometimes says, if we really localize, then we will be second class and we will lose status. And I tell you, we need a mass psychology movement in, uh, in the development peace building fields so that we can really understand local uh, control of projects. But in the longer run, we have to assure that countries are able to deal with their own crises of violence. And to do that requires an understanding of what countries think is possible for them. Where do they think you can increase the abilities of ministries of justice and internal affairs ministries to, to look at peace options and to foster those in society? Where do you have to have better training programs? Where do you have to have think tanks that are positing new strategies of reconciliation and peace? How do you inculcate uh, among children in 
curricula that there not only are war stories in your history, but there are important peace stories and that that's a part of our country's tradition as well. Now, to really work on those issues, to really say that, you, that countries need, need to think about the institutions and the human capacities to be far more self-sufficient and hopefully 100% self-sufficient in solving their own political and, and uh, uh, military crises. Uh, we believe a new international institution, an international fund for peace building needs to be established. An institution which can take a long-term perspective in working with countries on their institutional and capacity needs. And we think that because we really feel that there are excellent multilateral institutions now on special cases that prove the case that you can have an issue that is driven home year after year after year with long-term planning and effectiveness when you have a multilateral uh, special fund for this. That's been true in the health field, particularly PEPFAR in the US, but the Gavi Fund, the uh, Global Fund for HIV AIDS, uh, Malaria and Tuberculosis. So those are the set of policies that we put forward and we would like your vote and we'd also like about <laughs> $10 billion so that we can get this fund started. So if you'll look under your dinner plate tonight, you'll probably find an envelope and uh, fill it out. Okay, next question. Thank you, Bob, for there you go. For sharing these innovations um, that you and Dr. Pons are recommending in, in your paper. Um, and that you know represent modest, relatively modest investments in the UN to really enhance civilian responses, capabilities, and establish a standing uh, you know, police capacity, among other measures that you are recommending here with your long-term goal of seeing an international peace building fund. So where do we go from here? I go back to the question, what is the future of peace building? and how we can mobilize peace building communities for effective lasting peace. Well, uh, we are going to, sorry, there's a little echo here, trying to reduce this, okay. We're, we're going to, we we'll just launched this paper. Uh, you are in on the ground floor. Uh, and uh, I believe that there's, uh, a need for us to talk about this, the issues. Uh, and uh, the first thing that I would like is that the peace building community itself think about what its long-term future is. And maybe these are ideas that will figure well into it. I must say, when, when Richard and I have had discussions with peace building leaders, on this idea of a long-term fund, for example, we, uh, we've had a very positive effect. People say, yes, that's, that's what we, we really need, but somebody has to start these things. Uh, now, uh, I have uh, talked to uh, the former Minister of Defense of one of the major uh, Western European countries about uh, who's very, very active in peace issues uh, about sharing a, a group to organize the international fund we've talked about. Uh, that's organizing the fund is fairly easy, I think. It only requires 10 million. Let's see, that's about a million a piece for those who are listening in. Uh, and uh, we think we could we could raise that. Uh, by the way, uh, I think it will have some traditional and some new parts on it. Uh, it will be 
a Geneva-based organization because political neutrality is really important, but it'll also have a very important function in Singapore mm -hmm. because it's very important that we have much more attention to what's going on in Asia and uh, have the ability to have on the ground uh, leadership on those issues. Um, uh, Richard is one of the great international empresarios working on uh, global governance issues. And he is uh, one of the key factors behind uh, the uh, UN's planned summit on its future, which is going to come up uh, in 2025. 2024. One, 2024. Yeah. Sorry. Good. Even better. Uh, and uh, so I know that he will he will be able to get many of these proposals uh, before the world community. Uh, and uh, for every one that he gets through and gets passed, I shall personally give him a pistachio gelato. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sure he'll work hard to get that prize. Richard's. <laughs> All right, Richard, I see you are okay. Thank you for being with us. Does anybody have questions? Yeah, we would like to give the audience an opportunity to ask any questions or share comments regarding all of this. Um, most innovative recommendations. Oh, and Richard, could you put up on the screen again a link? It's a terribly long link. I terribly he did already. Just put it on. Is it so you'll be able to retrieve that in the chat, folks? Okay. All right. Questions, questions, questions. Comments. Comments, comments, comments. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm very late because I was in at some of the other sessions and uh, Bob, I'm fascinated. And Richard, I <laughs> want to read your paper. I started trying to glance at it. So I, I don't want to take up the time you probably described. I'm sure it's expanding uh, the Peace Building Commission at the, and the fund at the UN. Undoubtedly, I, I want to, so I don't want to ask questions you've already covered, but I'm thrilled to hear your proposal. And of course, totally agree as well as the expanding capacity of peacekeepers. So I guess everything is spelled out in the paper. I look forward to reading it. Thank you, Kim. Wonderful to see you and be part of this. I'll, I'll jump in while others are considering thoughts. Um, the uh, And I've shared uh, one more time for those who come in later in the uh, chat box, the, the link to the paper. Um, it's been such a pleasure to work with my dear friend, mentor, uh, close collaborator of many years, uh, Bob Bergen. And, and Bob, well, I'm sure I asked you this early uh, when you were organizing the famous International Development Conferences, which became the Global Meeting of Generations. Um, you had been an advisor over many years, maybe decades, to various senior leaders in the UN system, James Grant in particular uh, from UNICEF days, but the uh, Regional Commission for Africa. As it relates to where peace building is going, the focus of this discussion in our paper, what do you feel, you know, historically, going back uh, over a few decades, have been the core attributes, why you still believe in this multilateral institution when Let's be honest, <laughs> in the last few years, we've seen a pivot, uh, at least among political elites, uh, whipping up nationalist fears, populism, things that are antithetical to any kind of global cooperation, especially through bureaucratic institutions. So the UN has been dragged through the mud, to put it mildly, uh, by many governments, including longtime supporters and friends from within this country, the United States. So yeah, what, are, what, are, what do you feel, though, are touchstone uh, key strengths that have survived uh, during the UN's 75 years? Well, at one time uh, at the International Development Conference, we hosted a, uh, a discussion 
uh, an intergenerational discussion between Jimmy Carter and his grandson. And, uh, and the president, former president and I had a nice discussion during dinner about the UN. And I said to him, you know, you, you've, you've proposed and, and, and gotten enacted some really helpful financial contributions to the UN. And you've been a real friend of its work on peace and health and other areas. But I said, I think your greatest contribution to the United Nations was nominating Jim Grant to be the head of UNICEF. James P. Grant um, was a California lawyer uh, and he uh, had been at USAID. Then he started a think tank called the Overseas Development Council where I'm a senior fellow. And, uh, but the, what was so special about him, uh, so special that when, when I <laughs> when I broached this international fund to uh, to a very very good friend of mine who um, is uh, uh, one of India's most famous uh, successful ethical business leaders, chaired their second largest bank and so forth. He said to me, "Well, to get a fund like that started." Of course, you need another Jim Grant. I said, oh, well, <clears throat> there are not too many of them. But what Jim Grant showed is that you could be a real social entrepreneur, big time social entrepreneur, even in the United Nations. We recently had a head of the World Food Program who had all those kind of traits. He could speak truth to power, just like Jim did. I once was at a discussion with, with uh, uh, Jim and Rajiv Gandhi, and Jim held Rajiv by the, by the um, elbow. You're not supposed to really hold the parts of bodies of heads of state. And he put his finger under Rajiv's nose and he said, look, as I told your mother, <laughs> you should be blah, 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 <laughs> Indira Gandhi. So, so you have to have courage and you have to have, you have to have smarts and you need to send, if you're a, a responsible government, you need to spend the, send the best people to the United Nations. And and you, you, you could see, in my experience at least, who the best people were and how they were so different from people who just talked and did that. One thing which, which you had to be in the room to really understand was because of some work that I did, the, bank, the, the, the UN created something called the Chief Executives Board for, for its first 40 some years they had the administrative committee on coordination where the heads of agency would come in together and they would discuss such world shaking problems as the retirement age of staff and what should be the health uh, coverage of uh, and other fringe benefits, uh, just a terrible thing. But, but because we introduced the concept of system-wide initiatives. They had to get the system together around substance. So the meetings became really interesting. And what was fascinating to me was that I could ask the heads, the women heads of agencies to, to do certain things in the meeting, to get certain things accomplished, and they would get accomplished. They knew how to get from A to B and boom, it would happen. If I asked some of the men in that meeting to do the same thing, we would be on a trip towards Neptune. We would <laughs> just never get around to it. So I became an enormous fan of women who could bring together, who could sense, who had less ego and could be effective administrators. So I really focus on 
on people in the UN more actually than I do on the organization side. Yes, it is, has far too many organizations. I'll tell you one little out of school story. So at the Economic Commission for Africa, we would have an annual meeting of all the UN organizations working in Africa. We would need a table so long that you need our binoculars to see the end of it. But there they were sitting around the table. Not that long, actually, but then, you know, maybe it's just 60 organizations sitting around the table, 60. And so one time I said to the Undersecretary General who was chairing the meeting, I said, the folks that are sitting towards us at the head of the meeting, FAO, World Health Organization, Food and Agriculture Organization, UNESCO, UNDP, I said, I know those groups, you know those groups. But who are those people sitting at the other end of the table down there so practically out of sight? And he said, damned if I know. So, you know, if you don't even know the names of some of the organizations and you're an undersecretary general, maybe you don't need those organizations. <laughs> maybe you can consolidate some functions. Maybe every time you have a conference, you don't need to, as one of the outcomes, create a brand new organization. So there are some efficiencies that are needed. And frankly, we, it, the, the fact that we now have a deputy secretary general to coordinate a, sort of like a COO in a corporation, chief operations, that's a very good move. Um, uh, and we need uh, secretary generals who also can have the social entrepreneurial courage that you can have if you're a great world leader. Nice, good. <laughs> Let me get my volume back. If we still have a few more minutes, I'd like you to expand on the concept of um, going from transitional to transformational justice. What does that mean? You know, it's always important to go to expertise. So Richard, would you like to answer that question? Just uh, note it's been a question. Uh, yeah, I'll be very brief because I see our friends Gordy and Evelyn have a question as well. Uh, but uh, it's the it's the question specifically: Where are we going on transitional justice? You know, from transitional to transformational. To transform exactly that is the big jump because people realize. So there had been well over thirty well-known, documented transitional justice. Uh, initiatives. The most famous is probably the South Africa initiative uh, through their uh, Commission for Peace and Reconciliation. This is the end of the apartheid era, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And, uh, you know, there were key personalities that made that successful and other dynamics at play. Uh, but what we've written about is at the heart of the peacebuilding literature and, and, and the work of communities like ours, the Alliance for Peacebuilding, is you know, simply getting everybody around the table. Uh, reconciliation is an important first step, but to get to structural inequalities in society, the essence of goal 16 of the SDG is the one on sustaining peace, but inclusive societies, just societies, rule of law means political and often economic, social, structural change. Now you could bring in environmental factors, environmental justice. So thinking very much about things that will take to be fair, decades, if not longer, structural changes, we're trying to add, en enact big changes from uh, fossil fuel to green renewable energy economy. We know how difficult that is. Imagine you know, dealing with the issues of uh, slavery and, and other uh, parts of US history, which have yet to been fully reconciled. They take decades and stuff, but that's the essence of transformational justice. I think it's at the heart of what peace building is all about, the notion of positive peace uh, being about inclusive societies and justice as much as just the simple negative peace notion of absence of uh, violent conflict and laying down arms. 
So, um, but it's such an important shift and, and it's something that those who are serious and serious about peace building, yeah, need to take exactly the points Bob has been making in connection with our paper today of a long-term view and, and not just actors in the UN system, although we, we spent a lot of time on that, they, the actors in the UN system are catalytic towards the real action at the community level uh, and, 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 and that even national and transforming national actors. And that's why this signature idea that Bob came up with an international fund for peace building is so important, modeled on the global fund for AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria. So it's going straight to actors who are on the front lines and, and supported by the international community to be sure. There's lots of catalytic roles, monitoring, initiative, sharing lessons learned, but it really has to be the uh, protagonists at the most local level who know their country, know their culture, that are gonna be the key to terms like transformational Absolutely. justice. Local empowerment. Thank you, Richard. Gordon, you have a question. Uh, actually, Evelyn has a question <laughs> on our behalf. Okay. Um, my question, well, I, I go back to the key point I think that was made that ultimately it's people that make the difference. And um, the idea in the, in the peace, peace building community has been a sort of split between those who are there for ideological reasons, good intentions, and those who are there because they are technically capable and increasingly um, the literature is indicating that one, to be effective, you need both. And um, Mr. Berg, we met many years ago, where we talked about peace professionalism. And um, the move at the moment, and we're part of it, is to identify the key characteristics in terms of core values that motivate and key skills that enable effective peace building. And so I just wonder in your work, in your considerations, have you been looking in at, I mean, you mentioned personalities, but beyond that, have you looked at what it is that, that um, would personify an effective peace builder? Because ultimately it's the people that are are at the heart of everything we do. And we would love to have a further exchange at some point about the work we do towards that. Great. Uh, I think it's very instructive for us to, to learn uh, the case history of Colombia. Yeah. Because in Colombia, you had everybody somehow involved. I mean, maybe not everybody, but every professional group I could think of was involved in pushing peace. So you had, of course, the clergy. You had, of course, uh, um, uh, the the government people who were uh, who saw the damage that was going on. Not all government, but a lot of it. You had the business community that says we really can't survive as an economy uh, uh, unless there is peace. Uh, you had the education community. Uh, you even had the advertising community. The advertisers put up billboards in which they had pictures of the FARC people uh, when they were like one years old, that only you, know, only you could recognize your, your picture when you were one years old. So, and they had them you know, 30 or so on a big billboard. And the line was, it's time to go home and thousands of them left. So everybody had a role. And, uh, uh, and one group was not sufficiently brought in. And this is true in far too many situations. And that was the military. Mm -hmm. When we proposed this fund, 
we propose 80% for what peace builders would, would, rec would realize, you know, pretty well, what I mentioned, academic programs, training programs, uh, uh, government institutions, think tanks, blah, 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 uh, and a huge packet for uh, enhancing civil society, not only individual organizations, but making them collectively more uh, uh, effective. Okay, great. Uh, but we also say 10% for education and, and, and mass campaigns, and 10% to foster security sector reform. There have been, in the last total was some years ago, but 40 cases where security sector reform helped security services move from predatory to protected. And security sectors have undermined so many different peace arrangements. And they, they started to do that in Colombia, but fortunately there were all these other Peace builders called businessmen, religious leaders, uh, academics, uh, government ministers, and you know, da -da 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 -da, uh, journalists, uh, community leaders, you know, that that they they learned to live with the agreement. They found agreement, and Colombia, from a country that accepted. That, that sent out during its crisis, two million residents to Venezuela, now has accepted a couple of million or more Colombians and still is growing strong and is a member of OECD. So it's an interesting case mm -hmm. to me that peace building should not be restricted to peace builders. <laughs> and we have to really get a lot of people to, to be, uh, to honor peace and to work for peace. Mm -hmm. Similarly, peace. similarly, we need in the United Nations to learn how to make friends outside of the United Nations. I think the United Nations has one of the poorest public relations programs that can, can be found. I'll give you one example. Under Jim Grant's leadership, there were 12 of us who put together this World Summit for Children. Okay. And it was brilliantly done, not because of any one of us, but because of Jim's leadership and his insights. And what we could discuss, how do you make these things accountable? And we said, well, you can make a UN agreement accountable if heads of state will hold each other accountable. They're the only ones who will listen to each other uh, and so forth. The actions that took place in 1990 at the World Summit for Children have resulted to date of, of, to, of well over 75 million infants reaching age five healthily and moving on. 75 million who otherwise would have died. Now you would think a public relations department could make a little headway with something like that, you know? But we don't have that. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that, that to make friends in the public, the UN story really has to be understood. The other thing is that, that UNICEF did so well in creating ambassadors and in getting people to speak up for it. One of the best just died, Harry Belafonte, who was just spectacular at these things. And, and, you know, there are groups dying to be helpful. Uh, and, uh, and we tend to find the friends are, are too close, that is, you have to have unexpected friends to really make a mark, you know? Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that, that's something that, that uh, would be just, just wonderful. So I'm a little straying from your question, Evelyn, I'm sorry. If but, I may, uh, if I may. Go um, ahead. 
if I may. Um, first, it's very interesting you mentioned Colombia because we're actually part of an advisory group on establishing a Ministry of Peace in Colombia. Yes, uh, yes. So that's, I know I mean, that group, the Canadian group. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, the um, and actually, is some the Senate unfortunately ruled two days ago against the Human Rights Commission resolutions, and we're hoping they'll reverse themselves. But um, when I mentioned peace professionals, my our assumption is that everybody can be a citizen of peace, peace within, and peace with others. Um, everybody can choose to be a practitioner of peace, whether you're in business or elsewhere. Um, what we're talking about is those people who choose peace as a profession. At this point, there are millions around the world in that category. And at this point, there is very little work that has been done to bring together for those that choose peace as a profession to bring together the skills and the motivation. And, and I think you mentioned um, the tarnished, some of the tarnished rep uh, reputation for, for peacekeepers. And a lot of that, again, can be drawn back to, um, to this dislocate between skills and motivation, personal motivation. So, so I just wanted to clarify, we're not suggesting that only peace professionals do peace, but that those who take it on as a profession need yeah. to be held accountable for both their skills and yeah. their approaches, humility, well, the, integrity, et cetera. Yes, I, I agree with you very much. And I, I take your point. Mm -hmm. And I've been very, very pleased to see the growth uh, impact evaluation, other kinds of evaluation, holding the field accountable for its performance. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it makes a big, big difference. Now, when I when I started the impact evaluation work, of, and it was the first of any donor at USAID, I set up a system in which we would have a couple of professionals who understood evaluation, or they were area or subject experts, and then a couple of people from a different part of the agency to come and see what was going on mm. and to make a judgment. Because if you were from the Asia Bureau, you wouldn't mind criticizing a Latin America project. <laughs> you just don't want to criticize an Asia project. <laughs> so so they would they were they were wonderful on it and they could go back and they could uh, you know e e e we just had three week studies, but if we talked to enough people and we and we made good use of a four person team, we would get really interesting stuff. Now, I must say at the same time, the British had the same budget I had in their aid program, and they spent it all on exactly one study, all done by experts, and it had zero impact. Mm -hmm. So I believe that the mix of professionally trained plus others mm -hmm. are needed on this. And, and it's, uh, it's something that is a work in motion here. Right? And um, uh, I, uh, you, you, you're reminding me to push that a little harder. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So just real quick, I wanted to second um, various things that have just been said. Uh, obviously, yes, the UN story needs to be told more broadly. I think we all would agree with this. What, that's why the, we do the work we do with UNAs. The UN does not do a good job in promoting itself in, or its work, but that, that's not its mandate either. So I agree with you, Bob. But I, I wanted to say I've attended a number of the sessions, unfortunately, just online, because I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, uh, sessions of the AFP, and a common theme has been how do we reach out beyond the choir to gain more uh, people engaged with peace building, not just, again, professionals, how do we word it, how do we frame it, how do we engage more students, there was a fascinating session just before this about students, and it's really important to engage them, but how do you do it in a way that's 
that entices them to get involved. And so this is all on our shoulders to be able to speak it, to engage people and to uh, expand this work that's obviously so needed. So um, thank you, thank you for this. Um, let me just say on a personal note, I'm actually coming to the national conference. So I'm hoping to see some of you there in early June. Uh, it's been almost a year since I've been in D.C. and I miss it like crazy. But anyway, unfortunately, with that, I have to go. But great to see you all. And thank you for this let, session. Let me just quickly. I, I have a yes. little different view. I think it is part of its job. And that's now what UNICEF did is hard to replicate because it had a Christmas card business. And it had unrestricted revenue from that of a couple hundred million dollars a year, which they financed all their public affairs work from. And that meant that you could go to UNICEF and you could say, I, I'd like a picture of a five-year-old girl at a uh, water spigot in Nepal, uh, and they'd have it, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and they and they knew how to package this stuff. They had good staff doing it, and they rotated people from the regular part of the organization through that, so that they would know how to tell the story better. Any bigger organization has to have a public affairs group. There's no corporation. There's no government that doesn't. Now, I agree with you, Bob. I just wish it were more broadly. <laughs> well, there may have to be, you know. You know, we have 2,500 billionaires in the world now. There's got to be one of them who would like to endow a major public affairs uh, a function in the United Nations. I mean, you know, uh, somebody, uh, I really don't care where the money comes from. You know, my theory is the more you take, the less they have, but still, <laughs> I just. <laughs> Maybe we ought to invite Ted Turner back for another keynote speech at the That's UNA right. dinner. <laughs> That's right, exactly. You know, and and uh, uh, I, I think that the UN has to be very creative about these things. Yes, it does. Jim Grant, I, I'm sorry to keep going back to him because there are, but Jim Grant was a genius at raising money. Let me just tell you how he did it. Okay, he, he raised money from governments, for governments, but he, he went to heads of state and he did not say, like every other UN leader of a program would say, we are efficient, we are effective, we, 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 we need this project here, we need that project there. Da, 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 da. He wouldn't talk anything about that. He would say, this is good for you politically. And I'll tell you why. We have a resolution passed by the World's Bankers Association saying this, this act, our programs are good. We have a resolution of the world's religious leaders saying this program is good. You know, at the Summit for Children, I organized a session of major religious leaders from all major faiths. And it was a visible sign that this was this was something that was good, and we had we said every religion says to parents, take good care of your children. That was a theme, so that the, that the delegates would know if you did not agree to this, you're a bad parent. You know. So, <laughs> so anyway, there are all kinds of possibilities uh, from this, and and I think it's a time when when. Uh, good friends of the UN, and I, on this call, we all are, ought to be pushing our, our representatives. We have some wonderful ones now to really think creatively on some of these big issues. It's been a joy being with you. Thank you, Richard, for your incredible collaboration. Thank you, Paula, for all you do, including giving me your afternoon. And thank you, small but high quality audience. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bob and Paula. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, authors. Uh, can I, can I just so say that a Canadian fundraiser once said, the only tainted money is the money that taint mine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Good note to reflect. <laughs> Perfect. Wonderful to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Have a good Bye. night. Bye.